Welcome to Talking Giants Player Profiles and Projections, and today we have Adore Jackson. But first, we're going to talk about a guy known as Mongo, as a dirtbag, mm. and that's John Feliciano, the center for this team, six foot four, three hundred twenty-five pounds, thirty years old this year, out of the University of Miami, the U. Uh, brought him over on a one-year, three point two million dollar contract from the Bills. Now he's making the switch to center with an understanding of Brian Dable's offense and terminology. That's something that he did well, even playing from the guard position for the Buffalo Bills. But there's a reason he's on a one-year, three point two million dollar contract. Uh, John Feliciano's not a, not a very good player, but he <laughs> with 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 the way the Giants' cap situation was and Nick Gates' injury, it was a needed signing to bring some veteran uh, presence to the center position. It felt very deliberate and tact and tactical because when the, it was announced that the Giants signed John Feliciano, they it was announced that the Giants have signed center, not offensive lineman. Well, Feliciano even line. said, you know, when uh, they yeah. did their end of year meetings, he knew he was going to be cut. He said, and he knew Dable would get a head coaching job. He was like, come get yourself a, a someone who knows your offense to play center. Go. And that's ended, what ended up happening. Felt very deliberate. Um, John Feliciano has been very vocal that he feels, I think he feels a lot more comfortable at center. I think he said that. I think he thinks that he's a better center than a guard. Um, and I think he also knows that I think centers get paid a little bit more than guards too, especially if you're if you're solid and you're pretty good. So today's uh, this year's kind of like a huge prove year for Feliciano. I, th- I think him personally, th- those are the vibes that I got from him, kind of right off the rip and right off of when he signed it. I think he feels like. He has something to prove. I mean, there was the whole comments that he had uh, a couple months ago where he felt slighted by the previous coaching staff when he was benched, which is funny because some of the previous coaching staff, like the offensive line coach and the head coach, are currently here, and he's on the, he's on the team. Um, but really, my big takeaway you know, with John Feliciano is just hearing what Buffalo fans have had to say about him. And that's the main reason why I am not very – optimistic about John Feliciano. But at the same time, if we do end this year saying that John Feliciano was the worst offensive lineman on the team and not like... That's the hope. It, is it that kind the, of is, is that hope, left, right? The left guard <laughs> position could be better than him. And yeah. obviously left tackle, right guard, and right tackle should be better than so him. So if we're ending the year saying that and we're saying, oh, we need to get a center, I'm kind of kind of cool with that. Yeah, and at the end of the day, someone has to be your worst starter in your offensive line. Yeah. I'm hoping that it's John Feliciano and it's not... Uh, you know, a battle between Nate Solder, Will Hernandez, and Matt Skura. My God, I hate saying that out loud. Yeah. Um, but just kind of resume stuff. He started 39 games in his career, most notably 29 with the Bills at guard. Um, four games he really played and uh, a lot of reps for the uh, Bills at center uh, in the last seasons. But was ultimately bench and not. Uh, he was benched on a not so awesome Bills offensive line as yeah, well. You and know? they started playing better without him. Yeah, and that's something that you know we talked with Anthony of the cover one, from the cover one Bills guys that like, hey, like the offensive line looked better when he was out, and that's what, until ultimately why he was watching you know a scoring fest uh, for the Buffalo Bills in yeah. those playoff games. Yeah. Um, now again, it it is notable that he does take leadership seriously, mm-hmm. and I don't think that should be discounted. And he's known for setting protections even from the guard spot and. You know, this is just a glimpse, and maybe this still happens with John Feliciano. Uh, and I don't want to date it too much, but we watched practice on Friday without John Feliciano, and they could not – not that they were getting beat by blocks, but they were having free rushers all over the place. Like, they were really struggling yeah. to pick it up. I know it's day, it's day three versus Wink Martindale, so some of that's expected, but it looked really ugly without Feliciano out there. Yeah, and I kind of want to ask you, like, the last point that I have here is value for having – experience not just with Brian Dable but with Bobby Johnson as well how valuable is that with the new offensive line with basically four new starters if you you know want to count Shane Lemieux coming off of injury well it has to uh, confidence is a huge part of playing that center position calling things out and like you said he's the he's he has come over with Bobby Johnson where Thomas Lemieux Azudu Glowinski Neal those guys are learning this offensive line yeah. and this offensive line scheme that they're going to try and run. Where Feliciano knows what he's doing, so it really does help. And we, talk, you know, if there's one position where unity and consistency really yes. matter. It is that offensive line spot, and I think that's why they made it a priority. That hey, if when, like we're going to get John Feliciano in day one of free agency. Do you have any notes on? What Feliciano was like as a player, strengths, weaknesses? Yeah, let's get into that. I want to hear about we'll start that. Start talking. About, so we'll go through pass pro first. What I have down is um, his pass pro is actually, I think, a little bit better than his, his run his run blocking because he's, he's not athletic. 
Um, like it's it's very heavy footed. Uh, his pass pro isn't horrible, although there are some really ugly games. You go look at that Chiefs 2020 playoff game. I mean, he was god awful. So there is some really ugly games in there, but he's not horrible. Like his feet consistently are moving to mirror, but great speed guys are going to give him issues. Now moving to center, he's going to be dealing with less with speed guys, but you can still get some issues with you know a linebacker lined up in the mm-hmm. A gap. You know, a quicker guy like a Michael McFadden type. So those that issues can show up. But it's going to show up a lot less at the center position compared to guard, where at guard you're dealing with sometimes great fast pass rushers stunting in. Uh, at center, you're not going to see that much. You know, he's got a good wide, strong base. And something like, you know, they signed Mark Lewinsky. I think he uses better hands in pass brother than Mark Lewinsky. Yep. Like, he really shoots his hands and has good hand work and readjusts them and fight them. So there's there's some good stuff in the pass pro, but the athleticism uh, doesn't – uh, it gives him issues, and again, there has been some really ugly games that he's had in the NFL. I did some digging, and John Feliciano has played four games at center since 2019. I didn't put the word started because Giants.com says that he started two games, but I have him as playing four where I saw on you know PFF you can go snaps by position, and you can see you know, if there's a game where he takes more than 20, 25 snaps in a game. I'm counting that you're playing center that game. So he's played four games since 2019 at center. Um, versus Tennessee 2019, versus Denver 2019, versus Seattle 2020, and versus Arizona 2020. Zero sacks, zero QB hits allowed in all those games. And the only game where he allowed more than one pressure was against Seattle 2020, where he allowed four. The rest of those games that I listed, he allowed one pressure. So the four games that he was at center, um, nothing that you're looking at saying, oh, I got to go check that out because how bad it was. Yeah, I will say seven pressures in four games is a lot. You know, like that... From the center position specifically, yep. but again, like the no sacks, no QB hits, that was that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. Um, so I actually I don't expect him to be a liability in pass blocking in the run game. Um, again, the athleticism is an issue. Like he doesn't have good athleticism in the run game, and if they're trying to move run wide zone and stuff, um, that can be an issue. But and I hate to repeat this point twenty freaking times in this podcast. The center is a lot less important than the guard when you're trying to run outside the tackles. Yep. You know. Um, so there's that, but he can, like, if you use him to pull, like he can kick out and do stuff like that, but also he won't be doing that as much from the center spot. Um, he's got good strength at the point of attack. Like he can get some good movement, but he, he needs to sustain his blocks longer. Like guys are able to shed him throughout the play, but he does bring a good, nice, good punch and power at the point of attack. So if he's working doubles, that really helps where you're, you're not, you're going to have help sustaining the guy. But the big issue with those doubles is how much of that initial pop do we get and we get some momentum and get our feet moving. Um, and it, But there is some bad times. Like he has some bad balance plays where he's just shed in it and it looks pretty embarrassing. Yeah. I'm just not not thrilled. Yeah. It, it's. I mean, it's again, we have five stars on the offensive line. Right now, you would say yep. he's the fourth best because we don't know what we have at left guard. Also, just leaves such a sour, sour taste in your mouth, you know, especially when you go from Gates, who, you know, who you Yeah, that's, and, and that's what's like frustrating that. is that they actually finally got a guy at center, and we don't know if he's going to play this year um, yeah. or not. But I will say and that, even you know. He, like, I, I'm, I'm not, at this point, I don't have any expectation for Gates to play this season. Yeah, but I, but I will say that the dirtbag thing is cool. Um, you know, an offensive line with a bit of attitude um, is, is very, very cool. You know, I'm sure, hey, Glowinski's maybe quietly an aggressive guy, but I, I'm not even sure if I heard him say one, one word throughout this entire offseason, throughout this camp. Uh, any, anybody, anybody checking him out, interviewing? Obviously, AT is kind of quiet, reserved. Evan Neal is even more quiet and reserved. Um, you know, so having a little bit of an, an attitude and spunk on this offensive line, a young offensive line, um, I, I, think that's, I think that's kind of needed, and it's, whatever, it's what every good offensive line kind of strives for. So if John Feliciano can provide that for a year, um, you know, give us some attitude, give us some, give us some spunk, help these young guys learn the offensive line and help these guys uh, gel up. I'm for it. Don't be as bad as Billy Price. Yeah. Well, that's it for our center, John Feliciano. We're going to move on to cornerback of Dory Jackson. But first. But first. But Bear first, Burger. How many Bear, Bear Burgers Burger. has John Feliciano eaten in his life? I bet you if we, I bet you if John Feliciano is a guy who like likes to see what people are saying about him, he listens to this and he hears the Bear Burger at, I guarantee you John Feliciano will go have a Bear Burger. John Feliciano does, probably does not like me. Well, he likes Bear Burger. Likes Bear Burger. Who doesn't like Bear Burger? Bear Burger because they got something for everyone. Yes, even you. Um, ostrich burgers, elk burgers, bison burgers. I've been saying it so much. I've been saying it so often that if you haven't tried it at this point, you're nuts. 
you are nuts. They have a happy hour in New York City. That's the best in the city. 12 to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday. They have bar bites at Bear Burger Kitchen and Bar. All food items are $9.95. Monday to Friday, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. This includes two Nashville sliders, six PBRs, and a martini, all for under $20. They have lunch specials Monday to Friday, 12 to 4 p.m., $14.95 all served with fries. So click the link in our description to find yourself at your favorite new happy hour spot, Burger Joint and Luncheon, Bear Burger Kitchen and Bar. You know they're sponsoring our summer series. Thank you to Bear Burger. Love you. All right, let's talk about cornerback Adore Jackson, 5'11", 185 pounds, 26 years old, former first-round pick out of USC. Signed a three-year, $39 million contract. Had $5 million of it pushed into 2023 and avoided a void year. It was obviously the second biggest contract signing of the 2021 offseason with Dave Gettleman and Joe Judge. And really improved like the, the, the DB room. Uh, you know, Tennessee Titans fans had a little bit of a bad taste in their mouth because he didn't play all the time. You know, in this last season, he missed 13 games. But... Justin, for 2021, I had him as our most outstanding player on defense, more so than Xavier McKinney, more so than anybody else on that defense. But here's the issue. is As great as that year is, and as much as he's the same player, his role is changing to a cornerback one, and you were playing in a new defense. So there is still question marks of what Adore Jackson uh, will be this next season. And he still missed five games. He played 13 games. But you don't really realize that uh, that it was that you know th- that's a good amount of games that that you miss right there, and especially if we're talking about you know CB one versus CB two, you can kind of especially Patrick Graham. Patrick Graham was able to live without a CB two for a couple weeks, but CB one, very very different story. Um, last summer, I said on this same PPP that the Adore Jackson signing could mean more for the team than the Kenny Galladay signing. I never imagined how right that take would actually be, but it is 100% true. We were on the Raider mailbag episode, and you were like, wow, the the Adore Jackson signing, it's the the best acquisition move of the offseason. And I clipped that, and I was like, I literally said this back in August. I am smarter than you. Um, Adore Jackson (laughs) is smarter than both of us, but... Uh, I again. I, we Best both, smile on the team. No, I had him as the most outstanding player last year. You didn't. So yes, anyways, for years. Um, let's look at some numbers with Adore Jackson. So yeah. his advanced stats. You know, QBs throw. Uh, you know, targeting Adore Jackson in 2021, he had th- gave up 38 catches on 73 targets. That's 52.1 completion percentage. Is that good? I'd say yeah. I think it's. I'd say it's pretty freaking good. Yeah. Uh-huh. He had 353 yards allowed. Is that good? Yeah, twenty. That, what does that uh, go to per game? Twenty-seven yards per game. Do you think allowing uh, the other team's wide receiver two to get twenty-seven yards per game? And I will say he didn't always cover wide receiver two. Who was a you know we we did play Tyreek Hill and we did stop Tyreek Hill yeah. from going over the top even though he did have a solid. And during game. that game, you know there were times last year where James Bradbury was covering like tight ends, like when we played Darren Waller, um, when we played Travis Kelsey, like that's where James Bradbury was covering these tight ends. So what's Adore Jackson doing? Probably covering wide receiver ones. Right, two touchdowns, one interception, four point eight yards per target. Uh, you know, uh, nine point three yards per completion. Those were fifth. Those are both fifth in the NFL. And guess what? A mm. couple of those guys in there got like less than forty targets uh, ahead of him. So he was like top three out of guys who actually played a lot and targeted a lot in yards per target and yards per catch. Like just absolutely dominant. There was a four game stretch in there where it's like he gave up like like sixty yards in four games. Those numbers are his career best, and they are just flat out dominant numbers. Like he was an outstanding player for the New York Giants last year. Um, But what stops him from being talked about around the league was one, being on a bad New York Giants team. But he's got to catch some interceptions because he had some opportunities and some easy ones too, and he did not pull them in. If he can get those interceptions, and he's not going to replicate those numbers that we just said. He's not. But have solid numbers, he can be a good, respected cornerback one. Like I think he's a... a, like. Adore Jackson being your cornerback one to me is not an issue. Having him as your cornerback two is an extreme luxury, but having a cornerback one is fine if he can stay healthy. If he can stay healthy. I and mean, also, I mean, you, you, we could easily brush off the, you know, catching interceptions points up. Oh, these are DBs, not wide receivers. But let's just, you know, go back to that Atlanta game where I think that was the more, that was the most famous dropped interception that so he had last year. Winning a loss. The Atlanta one was really bad. It was a 14-7 to game. The Giants were winning. There was five minutes left in the third quarter. 
um, and it was a second and goal. I mean, you catch the ball, um, you know, Giants take control, and they're on the 20-yard line, and, you know, they're probably going to go three and out, but, you know, you're going to punt, and the, and the ball's going to be on the other side of the 50-yard line with, like, two or three minutes left. So, I mean, that is, that is the difference between starting out 0-2 and 1-1, and, 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 you know, maybe the vibes heading into the, you know, heading into the, you know, latter part of September are a little different. I mean, Adoree Jackson's getting paid a lot of money. He's getting paid a lot of money, and he is getting paid CB1 money. You know, it's not just, hey, this guy's going from CB2 to CB1. He's getting paid a lot of money. So, you know, come down with those interceptions, and the narrative is, you know, going to be quite different this year. I have numbers versus man coverage. Do you want me to get into that? Yeah, those are actually really interesting. Okay, so Adoree Jackson, obviously going to be playing a lot more man coverage this year because that's what Wink Martindale likes to do. Um, Adoree Jackson, much better in man coverage than James Bradbury, and that was kind of an issue heading into this year if Bradbury was going to be on the team. Don't have to worry about that. 23.6% of the snaps, this is what PFF has, 23.6% of the snaps last year, Adoree Jackson was playing in man coverage. 12 receptions allowed, 22 targets, 54.5% catch rate, 131 yards allowed, 19 yards after the catch. That is not a lot, and that's kind of wonderful. 72.3 QB rating, 12.8 average depth of target. But the catch rate, the low catch rate that he allowed just overall, and what all the sites are kind of tracking, it very much mirrors what he did versus man coverage last year as well. I think Adoree Jackson was a top 15 corner in man coverage last year. Yeah, and that's the thing that makes it so exciting about you know, moving into the Wink Martindale defense, unlike uh, James Bradbury, who was like, hey, I'd like, I'd love to keep James Bradbury al- around, but there is a question mark to how he'll fit into the scheme. And again, he's got what his, I mean, he's got elite speed, you yes. know, and before we even signed him, you know, if you go watch the original film breakdown, one of the matchups I featured was against Tyreek Hill and the Chiefs. And I was like, this guy not only is staying with Tyreek Hill, but there was times where Tyreek Hill beat him off the release and he was able to recover and get back mm. in that hip pocket. Like, that was really impressive. Um, you know, that was like the game that really sold me on Adoria Jackson was yep. that uh, game versus Tyreek Hill um, in a game that I think the Titans ended up winning. But so, games in the... I wanna, I'm sorry, cutting you off, but games in the division are going to be huge this year because we were burned by Amari Cooper, who was obviously not on the Cowboys anymore, but there's still CeeDee Lamb. Um, A.J. Brown is now in the in the NFC East. We DeWante were burned. Smith's still pretty good, too. We were burned by Terry McLaurin last year, especially that game in Washington. So, um, you know, obviously those guys, I feel like they're a little bit more bigger. They're a little bit more physical, especially A.J. Brown. So how is Adoree Jackson going to stack up against those bigger physical wide receivers? We obviously know that he's fast and he can stick with those speedy guys. Uh, but how is he going to stack up against those guys? Because some of these wide receivers in the NFC East are pretty darn good. Yeah, and that's what I said. It'll be interesting to see how he handles bigger wide receiver one roles because yeah. where he mostly was on smaller guys last year. Yep. You know, and not, you know, not because of, oh, this guy's wide receiver one, wide receiver two, but if you're facing the bigger guy, it's like, okay, well, let's put James Bradbury on him. He's more physical. Yep. You know, he doesn't have the greatest man coverage skills, but when you're playing bigger guys, you don't need, uh, you know, that, that crazy, you know, change of direction speed. You yep. kind of got to be more telegraphing what they're doing. So, but he, he has the speed to play with anyone and he does fit this wink, uh, Wink Martindale man cover yep. scheme. He likes to jump routes, which will give with Wink Martindale, he's going to have those opportunities to get interceptions. And that's why this year, even I think more so than last year, catching some interceptions is going to be a bigger deal because I think there's going to be more opportunities for him yep. and not just, you know, 40 yards down the field where a team tries a deep pass, but like, you know, jumping it, jumping a slant. Uh, you know, we saw him drop one in training camp on a, on a bubble route. <laughs> Uh, or on a, sorry, on a, on a rub route, but he so, catches a ball behind his back which, on a punt, which it made me it kind of made me mad. It was like one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. Just a Dory Jackson catching a a punt, and, th- and that was out of a you know what do you call it? Not the punter didn't punt it, but it was jugs out, machine. It was out of a jugs machine, and it was forty feet up in the air, and he just casually just whoop catches a ball behind his back, and it's like oh, you had to do that. Yeah, you but get, that? getting those interceptions when you're <laughs> jumping a route and compared to you know thirty yards down the field can. Be turned into six points. Yeah, it could turn into uh, your offense starting at the uh, opponent's eight yard line. Yep. So he really has to come. I, I'm not expecting. Listen, I'm not expecting Adore Jackson to just be like he get, he catches everything that's you know in his hands. But let's let's turn some of those into some interceptions yep. and not like last year where, like like last year it tainted what he was thought of. 
Where I remember putting out I think, like I think like, even more. I, I, I like I put out I was like I was like Adore Jackson has lived up to the contract and has been playing amazing. And if you go look at my replies, I was like, well, he drops interceptions. This guy sucks. Yeah. He drops. And it's like, no, watch. Like you can't just judge a cornerback on that. But we need him to to get some more of those. And also, people associate Adore Jackson with losing Dalvin Tomlinson, which I don't really. Well, why not associate you know losing Dalvin Tomlinson with Kyle Rudolph? Why not, why not associate over you know somehow Nate Solder is still staying here, um, and he's still somehow on the team. So. Uh, uh, I appreciated appreciated Dory Jackson's 2021 season a little bit more as we head into the 2022 season, and it'll be fun to see what it looks like, especially when he may not be getting as much help. You know, I think uh, cornerbacks maybe got a little bit of a little bit of help last year, especially with that too high system. I think you're going to see a lot more single high safeties uh, this year, where there's going to be one uh, there's going to be one safety kind of center field uh, patrolling center field and maybe giving help to one side versus the other. So Dory Jackson maybe t- you know there's going to be times with the young secondary where he's alone on his island. He's got to take care of business. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's uh, another player profile and projection. We'll be back again tomorrow. We appreciate you guys. Until then, let's go Big Blue.